trusting us with really, you know, what's going on all around us. We're, we should be the ones that are making the difference. Amen? Not the other way around. Not the world influencing us, but us setting the tone. And it's time that the church began to take her place and began to be the voice that the Lord intends us to be. And so we're going to look a little bit tonight at uh, just the, the days that we're in, really, and how to pray in the days that we're in. And we know that we're in the last days because the last days began in the book of Acts. Acts uh, chapter 2, when Peter got up to speak, we know he, he referred to what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he said this, It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So he poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. Amen. In the book of Acts, and we're still writing the book of Acts today. Goodness knows what chapter we're on, but I believe we're on with one of the last chapters, if not the last chapter in the book of Acts, because the book of Acts is where the church was birthed, where the church was born. And, uh, you know, I believe the days when the church aged, the dispensation, the end of, uh, you know, the dispensation of the church, where the end of the age is going to come. So he gave us the fullness of his spirit, poured him out on all flesh, not only to rest upon us, but to be in us. Amen. So we don't just have the spirit upon now, we have the spirit within. So we have this dimension, we have the a uh, 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 power and access to such power that they never had before now that the Holy Spirit is residing and living in us thank you Walter the people of God so we're in the last moments by now of those last days and so the disciples came to him and they asked him about the end of the age and what would be the sign of his coming and it really didn't mean too much to and sometimes, sadly, I don't think too many Christians understand it today because there's a lot of fear surrounding the last days. People think it's all kind of doom and gloom. And for some, it is, but not for the church. Not for the church. Amen? The church, this is the time for the church to arise. This is the time for the glory of God to be displayed so that we can take as many people with us. Amen? Because the church is the one that's restraining the evil from being unleashed, from restraining the enemy from just riding on and doing you know, what he wants. He cannot do what he wants because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is here, you and I. And when we're exercising our authority, when we're standing in faith and we're praying and we're believing and we're doing the things that we should be doing, then we are doing some damage to the the, the plans of the enemy. Now, there's certain things that we can't stop, but we can certainly pray some confusion in the enemy camp. Amen. And remember what caused the confusion in Jehoshaphat's time was the praises, the praises of the people of God. Irregardless of what they saw, regardless of what was coming against them, they were praising, they were prophesying, they were rejoicing. And the enemy got confused. And so all three of them, the armies that had risen against the nation of Israel, started to attack each other. Oh, that's the way to bring confusion in the enemy camp. Amen. Is to rejoice and praise God. Even though we might be going through the fire, even though we might be experiencing some challenges, even though we're living in this day and in this age when things are being shaken, but that should not apply to us. Amen. We cannot be shaken. Why? Because we have the greater one living on the inside of us. And Philippians, I believe it is, tells us that we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors through him who loved us. And we need to say to these things, we need to prophesy. The Spirit of God is upon us. He's being poured out. Prophesy is to, is to declare, is to bring forth the word of God. It's not always yo ye yo ye, thus says the Lord, but it's decreeing and declaring as well. So Jesus gives them a list of things that will happen at the end of the age. Now we know that his second coming, the actual coming of Jesus, is separate from the snatching away of the church. 
it's a separate event and that the coming of the Lord Jesus is after immediately after the Bible tells us the tribulation period so these signs he mentioned there's wars there's rumors of wars nation rising up against nation kingdom against kingdom hatred strife people getting offended and betraying one another well these things have been happening since the beginning of the last days in the book of Acts right but there's an escalation now there's an increase in the frequency there's an increase in the intensity of these things that are taking place just like when you get ready to give birth to a baby the pains increase they get closer together so they increase in intensity and then there's a time where there's a transition and I believe that that transition time is taking place right now there's a shift in the spirit a transition and when the birth of a baby is imminent that transition stage is now the time when you can begin to push because the birth is near because everything's ready in the woman's body to bring to push out that baby to give birth and I believe that we're getting close to the delivery so the birth pangs are increasing in frequency, in intensity. Amen. We've experienced many changes in our world that perhaps have never been experienced before. Whole nations, well the whole world being shut down. The churches being closed. My Lord. The mouths of the people of God having to be masked and not to sing. Excuse me? It contravenes the Word of God because we're not to forsake the gathering together, especially as we see the end coming, especially as we see these things happening. We've seen fear on a global level where people have literally been paralyzed by fear. And in many, many circumstances, I believe what people have feared have come up, has come upon them. You see, fear enables control. Afraid to go out of the homes, walking the dog and people jump across the pathway in case they go anywhere near you. Things coming out now, statistics and figures to show that what was classed as conspiracy and false facts was actually true. That very few people actually died from COVID. The manipulation of figures, a covering up of so many things. Well, what is the church's response? The church's response has to be, we recognize the signs of the times. We know the voice of our Father. We know the leading of the Holy Spirit and the signs of the times because we have the greater one in here. We have the one who knows all things and sees all things and knows what's coming up, dwelling on the inside of us. The spirit of wisdom and revelation he's living inside us increase in censorship in media feeding 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 what we want you to think and what we want you to believe switch it off so that we are feeding and feeding on the word of God knowing exactly what the word says so that we have our answer and we have our anchor and we know exactly what we're standing on amen in answer to the question the disciples asked him he says in Matthew 24 4 take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will deceive many you see there are some people today who think they can replace God they think that they can play God they think they can mess around with what God has created and ordained and established so that they can push him out so that we no longer need God and those Christians that we can change the family we can change the way things have been set up or the way people think about those things take heed that no one deceives you so how do we take heed that no one deceives us? How can we be sure that we're not going to be deceived? Well, 
when our life is hidden with Christ in God, when we're abiding in His Word and His Word's abiding in us, when we have a love for the truth, we won't be deceived. When we know our Father, when we know the Spirit of God and His leading, we won't follow the voice of a stranger. We won't be deceived when someone comes along saying, oh look, look at all those miracles that are taking place. Lying signs and wonders. We got the Spirit of God. So we know, oh no, 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 no. That's not my God. That's not my Jesus. That may be someone who has an appearance of something good. You see, because a lie is often peppered with some truth. Because you wouldn't be deceived unless you thought it was right. So we got to guard our heart and a love for the truth is a guard against deception. Those who abide under the shadow of the Almighty, those who dwell in the secret place, don't just pop in on a Sunday occasionally, but those who dwell in the secret place, those who are in tune with the Holy Spirit and know His voice and know that witness, mm, it seemed right to me, it seemed right it seemed right. Often we see that in the scriptures. So we got to know him. And in order to do that, we got to be people of prayer. Because if we're not people of prayer, then we're not communing with our Father. And if we're not communing with our Father, we're not going to know him. We're not going to know him. Amen? And we could follow the voice of a stranger. You see, we need to step up in our quest to know him more intimately because the more intimately we know someone, the more in tune we are. The longer you're married to someone, you actually could finish the sentence that they begin because you're in tune more and more so with that person. You know how they operate and how they function because you're intimate with that person. So the more in tune with the Holy Spirit we are, the more discerning we will be. What is Him and what is not Him? What is truth and what is not truth? What to stand up for and what to resist and stand against? What to take on board and what to resist? Yes, Amen, Uzziah. These days, we need to utilize this powerful gift we have of praying in the Spirit. Because praying in the Spirit not only enables us to be praying and to have, you know, to be privy of situations that we know nothing about, that we can pray, it also builds us up. You know, when you pray in the Spirit, I'm sure you've experienced it, suddenly something will come up and you think, ah, oh, I never thought of that. Oh yes, I see it now. I'll do that. So we stir up the gift of the Holy Spirit. We stir up, you know, it, it builds on our faith, builds us up on our most holy faith. It doesn't produce faith, but it builds us up on our most holy faith. Amen. So there are certain things that have to happen, but we can still be praying against the plans of the enemy and praying in the will and the purpose and the kingdom of God. And we can be preaching the gospel. Amen. He goes on to say, nations and kingdoms will be against each other. Famines, earthquakes, these are just the beginning of sorrows. Verse 13 says, he who endures to the end will be saved. Now sometimes people look at that and they think, oh my goodness, I've got to endure to the end. Well, that's not what the word means. This word here means to hold one's ground in conflict. It means to bear up against adversity. It means to hold out under stress. It means to stand firm, to persevere under pressure, to wait calmly and courageously. It certainly is not a, uh, you know, a passive resignation to fate. It is not clinging on by our fingernails. It is standing up righteously and passionately and enduring. Amen. But with a smile on our face, with our faith intact, with the praises of God coming out of our mouth, praying for our nation and for our neighbours. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He who endures to the end will be saved. How do we endure? Well, Paul's prayer in Colossians chapter 1 verses 9 to 11 goes like this. I do not cease to pray for you and to ask 
that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthen with all might according to his glorious power right not even strengthened with the might that we have not even increased in that might but strengthened with his might hallelujah for all patience and long suffering with joy with joy well that's really strange how can you have patience and long suffering and be joyful because that's the power of our God. Amen. We don't have to wait till all the ducks are in a row because they rarely are until we are joyful and happy. Always hoping that things are going to change and get better. Oh me, oh my. No, I thank my God upon every remembrance. I pray for you, praying that you may be filled and strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy and that word strengthen is dunamu one of those dunamis explosive words amen so you might be strengthened we can pray this prayer you should pray it every day it's really good for you amen so that we can be filled with this dunamis power of God because we need some wisdom as well we need some spiritual understanding to discern what's going on around us amen what to stand against and what to embrace so if we're abiding in our position and our position is one of authority our position is one of being seated in heavenly places but it's equally as important that we understand our position here where are we to be positioned in the body of Christ? Where would the Lord have us? Because that's another place of covering that we have. Being in the perfect will of God is where I want to be. Amen. So we need to be abiding in our spiritual position. Knowing who we are and who we are not. Right? I am not. Uh, you know some sort of patched up although sometimes I feel like it you know when you've been a real broken vessel it's easy to sometimes slip back into that mentality and that way of thinking but we have to develop a righteousness thinking right we are as righteous as we're ever going to be we're never going to increase in righteousness whether we fall tomorrow or we fell yesterday it doesn't change our standing of righteousness before God. That's not to say we don't run to Him and get right with Him. Amen. We need to know our inheritance, what we've been delivered from and what we've been delivered to. Because the enemy will try and negotiate you out of what you have been delivered into. Amen. To the victory, to the triumph to the healing, to the not just healing, but walking in divine health. Does that mean things don't come against us? Absolutely not. Things come against us. In fact, I believe the more you know, the more increase you get in revelation in this area, the more attack you have on your body or whatever. But you see, the application of pressure will reveal what you really believe. The application of pressure will reveal what you really believe. You see, faith that's not been tested is faith that can't be trusted. Amen. And so our faith will be tested, but that's how we find out what we believe. And that's the time to say, Lord, do what you need to do in me. God, I just abandon myself to you. I need you more than ever before. I don't want to go around this mountain again. I don't, I'm sure I've seen this, this weed before and my many times of going around the same mountain. You see, God is calling us, I believe the last two Sundays, calling us to come up higher, calling us to lay aside a few more things Things, and each and every person is different and what's right for one is you know not necessarily right for another at that stage where they are so we never compare ourselves we just say Lord I'm emptying myself of myself because I want you to fill me more I want to increase my capacity to receive from you amen amen our position is always one of victory remember that so you're standing on your champion. You're standing on your rock, on Jesus Christ, on the word of God, knowing our authority, knowing our inheritance. Yielded to him.
following him. You see, saved is so much more than making heaven. Saved, in, the word so, it, it, it in, involves deliverance. It includes peace, nothing missing and nothing broken. Peace is not the absence of strife. Peace is nothing missing and nothing broken. Provision, deliverance, healing. So whilst all these rumours of wars, unrest is happening all around us, verse 14 goes on to say, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. The end won't come when the enemy says so. The end will come when the gospel has been preached. And throughout all this time, we need to be preaching the gospel. Amen? Because once the whole world has heard the gospel, then the end will come and not before. So the gospel will be preached regardless of them trying to shut down again. The gospel will be preached regardless of them trying to shut the mouth of the church. Amen? Rebecca praise the Lord amen the gospel will be preached inside and outside we're not just coping we're not just holding on by the skin of our teeth amen we are strong we are empowered by God to withstand whatever may take place amen amen at the first coming of the Lord, we see Jesus. He went about preaching, teaching, and healing. Amazing miracles were taking place in people's bodies, in their lives. Miracles of provision, thousands fed, signs, wonders, moves of God, demons being cast out, and the nation was shaken. And the underpinning of this was the preaching of the gospel, the good news. So before his first coming, there was some preparation. John the Baptist came to prepare the way. Isaiah 40 verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He cried, what does that mean? Well, there'd been a famine of the word, a drought of the word, of the anointing of a move of God. And here comes John the Baptist and he's crying. The prophets of old did this. We're to do that, to cry, to decree, to prophesy, to speak, to call for things, to call forth things. And that was what John the Baptist did. He was calling for repentance, but he was also calling some things forth. He was saying, mountains, you will be made low. Valleys, you will be raised up. Crooked places will be made straight. He was calling forth for a transition, calling forth for things to be put in position, ready for the coming of the Messiah. He was preaching in a dry place, not just physically, but also spiritually dry. The word of the Lord, scarce, but he was a stream in a spiritually dry place. He was the voice crying in the wilderness. And interestingly, this word wilderness does not mean desert. This word wilderness here is translated mouth. There was a wilderness of the preaching of the word of God. But John the Baptist came and he was crying. Are we the ones today crying? Are we the ones today calling forth? for the second coming of the Lord Jesus. So it had to do with speech then. In other words, John the Baptist was, was, was displayed by his speech, by his words, by the delivery of his message, crying, declaring and prophesying. He came preaching a baptism of repentance, preaching that one mightier than him was coming. He was preparing the hearts of the people to receive Jesus. Are we preparing the hearts of the people to receive Jesus today? Are we preparing for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to establish his kingdom? Amen. He was making straight in the desert a highway for our God. A highway for God to come down. Do we need God to come down today? A highway for the anointing to come down. Do we need the anointing of the Lord to fall today? Absolutely, we do. 
Do we need an invasion of the glory of God today? Absolutely. And we're the ones who are to do this today, to prepare the way for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low, crooked places made straight, rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The opposite to way thing, the way things appear. Perhaps today we have people who have elevated themselves, made themselves lofty, artificial intelligence and all this kind of stuff. Perhaps there are, the pride of man is involved in this. The crooked places, all the wickedness that's gone on with deceit and lying. Are we foretelling and forthtelling the truth of the Word of God? Are we standing for righteousness and for truth? Are we speaking out or are we remaining silent? It's time to speak out, church. It's time to speak out. It's time to pray. It's time to, put, to throw down the gauntlet. It's time to throw down the rod and to see our rod eat up the rods of the gods of this world. Amen. The glory shall be revealed and all flesh shall see. So just as he was revealing and forthtelling, we too need to be revealing and forthtelling. Revealing the glory of God, the love of God for people, but praying. Ephesians tells us about the armor of God. We all have it. Praying, how often? Always. Praying, always. I mean, that doesn't mean like 24-7, every moment of every day, but it means that we are praying. We're praying. And there's a group of us here tonight, and we're praying always for our nation. We're praying always for revival, for the hearts of the people to be open to receive the Lord. We're praying always for an awakening in our city and in our nation. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praying always always with all kinds of prayers all types of supplication but praying always does prayer work absolutely prayer works there's a shift and i believe the more the, the church prays the more the church takes her place the greater the shift we're going to see we're going to usher in the presence of the lord and we're going to usher in the second coming of the lord jesus christ amen so let's be doing some praying always tonight shall we Father God, we come before you this evening. 